Greetings, family, and welcome to the African Exodus Show. I'm your host, Tony Cherie, here to you with a new video. Before we get started with today's segment, I want to remind you all, if you have not already added yourself to my Telegram channel, that's the best way to stay connected outside of YouTube. Very easy to download. You click the link, and it takes you right to the app. And there I post any time that I post a new video or if there's a video I don't want to share on YouTube, I'll put it there. In addition, if you wish to support this channel, you can do so through Cash App and you can also do so through adding yourself to my Patreon. There I will share a weekly video exclusive just for you. I wanted to do this video just as a background of a movement that many of you associate me with and I don't necessarily disassociate myself with, but I think we have to be very clear on what we're, what we're saying whenever we're using certain labels and certain titles, not because we're trying to justify ourselves with certain titles or certain labels or certain ways that we put things on ourselves to look a certain way. That's not necessarily the goal, but because you have to understand we're in a world where people use labels to draw up all of the things that they want you to be about. So for example, when you tell someone that you are a Christian, they will attach to you many things that you might not even believe. They will attach to you many things that you are like, I would not say that. So for example, I remember I did a debate a while ago and I said, I'm a Christian. And this person starts talking about the Pope and how, you know, the Pope is this, the Pope is that. I'm like, I don't, I don't believe in the Pope. The Pope, that's a demonic office to me, you know? There are things that will get attached to you whenever you take on these labels and we're going out into the world. And I think we also have to have that same ability to explain ourselves, explain what we mean when we say that some of us will say, I'm a Hebrew Israelite. If you take on that label, what are you really saying to the world? What are you saying to yourself? What are you? What are your beliefs? We have to be clear on these things because we're living in a world, again, that deals with labels and they will use that label to demonize you in every single respect. And I have a complete understanding of this. I understood when I came to understand who the children of Yasharel were, the blood children of Yasharel were, I understood, okay, there's going to be a lot of people who are turned off because when they hear you say that they say Hebrew Israelite and they attach so many things to you that you might not have ever even thought to think that you don't think at all. And I'm going to actually start with this Britannica article because I want us to talk about the things that we associate with when we talk about people who are Hebrew Israelite. Now it says black Hebrew Israelites. We know that's what people in the mainstream tend to call Hebrew Israelites. It says African-American religious community in Israel, the members of which consider themselves to be descendants of a lost tribe of Israel. Black Hebrew Israelites hold religious beliefs that differ from those of modern Jewish communities in Israel. Black Hebrew Israelites permit polygamy and forbid birth control. Leaders decide who will marry and whether marriage annulments will be permitted and they perform wedding ceremonies. Black Hebrew Israelites are vegans, avoiding the consumption of meat, dairy, eggs, and sugar. Members adopt Hebrew names to replace names they believe they can be they they believe could be derived from slavery. So several things in here, and definitely let's do a feedback. Let me know your thoughts on this. There's a few things in here that are like, hmm. Number one, I don't believe any of those things, right? I'm not a vegan. You know, I've had, I, I appreciate a vegan diet, first of all. I believe in eating more plants as possible. I have uh, Dr. Sebi books and I read them for information. And I believe there's many benefits to a vegan lifestyle. However, in the Bible, we know that the Hebrews also ate meat. They, they also ate chicken and, and they ate beef. You know, we know they ate goats. So I'm not of the belief that, it's more biblical to take meat out your diet. But if you're of that persuasion, that's your choice. But again, if you label me a black Hebrew Israelite, now I'm a vegan, right? Now I don't believe in birth control. Now me personally, I strongly advocate to our woman, if you use birth control, do not use hormonal birth control. Do the research on that. There's literally so many much evidence that this is all about the population control agenda. We won't get into that in depth in this video, but certainly these chemicals, these things, these hormones have the effect of changing things in your body that the most high design for it to be the way it is. You know, you're, you're supposed to have a monthly period, for example. So I have a feelings towards hormonal birth control. Do I think birth control should be forbidden? Me personally, I do not. 
However, I absolutely think if you are of the persuasion that children are a curse, you need to question that. However, even in biblical times, we know that if someone did not want a child, what would they do? They would either keep away from people or they would find alternative means of birth control. I don't think that there's anything that says birth control is wrong. But now that you live with me a Hebrew Israelite, I don't believe in birth control. I Let's see. What else do I, I believe? I, okay, so I have thoughts on polygamy. I'm not of the the belief that it's a sin. That's going to be a, probably a whole nother discussion in a different video. Um, but am I in a polygamous relationship? No. Would I be in a polygamous relationship? No, not if it's my choice. And so I don't know if I follow in that category. Um, what else did they say? Uh, leaders decide who will marry and a no miss will be per permitted. That's like a traditional African thing. It's good, I think, but I don't think that necessarily attaches to most people. And I did not adopt a Hebrew name um, just because I haven't felt led to and I'm not going to do something if I haven't felt led to personally. So as you see, putting a label on a, someone who believes they are a child of Israel, a child of Yasharel, does not necessarily tell you about that person does not tell you what that person believes does not tell you what that person does not believe and in this case it seems like this is more so talking about the the israelites who are in israel right now the hebrew israelites and we know that they face a lot of discrimination inside of israel but it's important that we understand there are different groups who have different beliefs but you won't get that just from the label hebrew israelite here are some other common things that I have heard people say that Hebrew Israelites believe and say, you're a Hebrew Israelite. You don't believe in the New Testament or you don't believe Yahushua is the Messiah. If you follow this channel, you know that that's not for me or that's not my belief. I believe absolutely in the New Testament. I believe absolutely in Yahushua. They say if you're a Hebrew Israelite, you practice Mosaic law. Again, we should do a teaching more on what law we practice. The scripture tells us you're resurrected by the spirit. You follow the law of the spirit in life. So the law of spirit in life, is that different from Mosaic law? Well, it's different in how you follow it. It's not different in the contents. But understanding that Mosaic law was followed in the flesh, in the light, law of spirit in life, is a supernatural experience where you are having the law written on your hearts instead of trying to appease man with your flesh. Very different context that doesn't necessarily be, get given whenever you just say you follow Mosaic law. Um, many Hebrew Israelites, they say, believe that only Hebrews can be saved. Only the descendants of Yasharel can be saved. I don't believe that at all. I think the scripture is very clear. You have the natural branches of Yasharel and you have the um, branches who are going to be grafted in. And by the way, if scripture tells us that only, I think it's 30 or only a third of Israelites will actually be saved in the end, only a third of the children of the Hebrews will be saved. There's going to be a lot of people who don't get in just because they are a descendant of Yasharel. And then also you have the belief that only African-Americans are Hebrew Israelites. I don't believe that. Some of you might believe that. I document, I think, pretty well in my book that the Hebrews are not just African-Americans. You have Africans in the continent. You have Africans in the, in the diaspora. You have so many people who have links to tribes that have been proven to be Hebrew. So, and when I said the book, for context, the book Conspiracy to Erase a Nation is available on Amazon. I basically go into detail about what tribes I have found that pretty much good evidence that these people are Hebrew. So I just gave you a few things that many people believe across the board whenever you're talking about Hebrew Israelites. And so now I want to talk to you about the importance of having intentionality, even though you should not feel like you have to explain yourself for acceptance of people. I think we should have this, the heart to explain ourselves whenever we say we have certain beliefs. And if you want to take on the label Hebrew Israelite, be able to explain what you mean by that label because there's a history behind these things. And that's the thing I want you to understand. We're going to talk about the history behind the label Hebrew Israelite. And I'm going to let you know that you should have an intentionality. That's basically all, all I'm saying is that if you feel like you're, you want to use that label, have it in your heart to explain to people what you do or do not believe. And if you don't want to use that label, because personally, I don't call myself a Hebrew Israelite, even though I know I'm a child of Yasharel. If you don't want to use that label, don't feel like you have to qualify yourself in the eyes of man by using a label that has a history to it that might go beyond what you believe. 
Many of you are probably aware the term Hebrew Israelite, both being in quotations, is not in scripture. So for me, I wanted to do some research on when was the term originally used. Let me say this up front. It's very hard to find a source on this. It's very hard to find a non-biased source. Most people who write about Hebrew Israelites are people who have a disdain for Hebrew Israelites. So I definitely will caution you in, if you're doing any research. And I'll let you know up front, this source right here is probably not perfect. But of all the sources I could find, this one, I would say, had less of an agenda and was more plain to the facts as far as what has happened in history. So I wanted to just go to the... Not the origins of us identifying ourselves as Hebrew, because I believe there's always been many people since the transatlantic slave trade and on who have had that recognition, rec recognizing that we are of the tribes of Yasharel. But specifically, I want to talk about the term Hebrew Israelite. Where did it start? You know, what is the the genesis of that term being widely used in our community? So again, I'm going to this article, the term, the title of it, A Brief History of Hebrew Israelites. It was written by a man who's Jewish, but again, I felt like he was very fair and it's written on ancient Hebrew, Hebrew review. To be clear, there have been many Jews who would today be regarded as people of color. Judaism is a religion, not a race. The idea that Jews are inevitably white is a product of the prominence of Ashkenazi Jews which is to say Central and Eastern European Jews and cultural representations. There are the Sephardi Jews and the Mizrahi Jews who tend to be darker skinned. And there are groups like the Beta Israel of Ethiopia. There are African-American converts to Judaism and descendants of converts. There is as well a long history of American history of mutual influence between black and Jewish communities stemming from a tendency to identify with each other as victims of discrimination at the hands of white Christians. Deanne Shapiro discusses the influence of this vision on the thought of Booker T. Washington, among others. Eventually, the idea of a true homeland that was somewhere else could come to serve as a shared touchstone. When I'm talking about Hebrew Israelites, however, I'm talking about a group that at least originated out of a particular movement that was what scholars call syncretic, which is to say that it combined beliefs and practices that were regarded, rightly or wrongly, as Israelite, are Jewish with elements that are recognizably Christian or sui generis. Today and for some time, some of these groups understand themselves to be simply Jewish, while others remain sui generis, members of churches with their own names and practices that are quite outside the orbit of normative Judaism, typically without interest in becoming inside. They have a range of beliefs about their relationship to Israel, Israelites, and Jews, some of which are harmful some not. The no. number of groups and the diversity of their beliefs is, of course, what makes Hebrew Israelitism such a complicated topic to discuss. While the question of what counts as an anti-Semitic belief or a Jewish one requires considerable sensitivity in the attempt. Still, there are a few things we can say about the origins uh, and development of Hebrew lightism in broad strokes, which might prove useful. First, it developed essentially out of two phases. The first took place before the end of the 19th century. A central figure here is William Saunders Crotty, a Black Union Army veteran born into slavery who was living in Oklahoma in the early 1890s when he started having visions that Black people were the descendants of the lost tribes of Israel. Crowdy would create the Church of God and Saints of Christ and travel the country with his message. He also sent proselytes all over the world without effect. The church still today headquartered in Suffolk, Virginia, and its self-representation is a case in point. On its website, it notes the church's adherence to the Judaism, tenets of Judaism and its celebration of numerous Jewish holidays alongside its promulgation of the faith and the teaching of the prophet Yahusha. Another early figure harder to pin down is Frank S. Cherry, who would establish the Church of Living God, the pillar and ground of truth for all nations. Typically, he is described as having founded his church in Chattanooga, Tennessee, around 1886. But as Cheru notes, this is actually hard to prove. It is clear that it was established or reestablished in Philadelphia in 1912. Cherry is, to some extent, the spiritual forefather of the strand of Hebrew lightism that is, quote unquote, anti-Semitic, and for that matter, anti-white. 
Unlike Crowley, he taught that Black people were the real Jews and that a great deception was practiced to keep them from that truth. He also preached a coming race war in which Jesus would return to destroy the white race. Today, various groups such as the Southern Poverty Law Center refers to as the radical Hebrew Israelites and designated as a hate group and espouses similar ideas. So a few things I want to talk about from this passage. One, many of you might not like this source, but again, this is the more neutral source that I could find. And I implore people who know more, if you have sources that are better about the history of the movement, please do provide them. I'm not above offering any corrections. However, while I do not take on their categorization of anti-Semitism, I think that the origins of two people who are associated with starting the Hebrew Israelite movement should be explored. So we have, again, Frank S. Cherry as one of the founders. And we also have as one of the founders, William Saunders Crowdy. Now, here's something that's just interesting about this. There's always an aspect whenever it comes to truth that Anytime Yah is planting truth amongst his people, Satan goes out and plants falsehood. He uses agents to, to plant messages that are going to, to corrupt the original message. And that's what happened, for example, with the Christian faith or the way, what did Lucifer, Satan do? He sends his agents who are going to corrupt the way and create a new religion, Christianity. The same thing with the Hebrew Israelite movement, which you kind of learn about the founders is that, first of all, a lot of them had beliefs that weren't beliefs that most of us would share. For example, we're going to talk about some of the beliefs coming out of the 60s movement. But something that I think is worth noting about these two founders that we just mentioned is that they were Freemasons. So I'm reading from um, a source that says Bishops Crowdy and his contemporary William Christian were both dedicated Freemasons who brought much of their fraternal order into their black Israelite churches. Also going to run over to this Wikipedia. I wanted to give you all other sources before I um, gave you the Wikipedia source. But it says the origins of the black Hebrew Israelite movement are found in Frank Cherry and William Saunders Crowdy who both claimed that they had revelations in which they believed that God told them that African Americans are descendants of the Hebrews in the Christian Bible. Cherry established the Church of the Living God in pillar ground, in pillar ground of truth for all nations in 1886. Crowdy founded the Church of God and Saints of Christ in 1896. Cherry taught that the Talmud was authoritative. Let me say that again. Cherry taught that the Talmud was authoritative. So don't necessarily think because this is one of the founders, you believe his beliefs, because I personally do not subscribe to that belief. He found the Talmud was authoritative and that Yahushua Jesus would return in the year 2000. We obviously know he did not return in the year 2000. We also know the scripture tells us no one knows the day or the hour. So clearly, we can assume Cherry was a false prophet. The playing of the piano and the collection of tithes during the Hebrew Israelite worship was forbidden by Cherry, who also taught the eastward direction of prayer and denigrated white Jews as interlopers. The Church of God and Saints of Christ originated in Kansas, retained elements of a messianic connection to Jesus or Yahushua. Another early figure was William Christian. The pioneers of the movement were Freemasons and strongly influenced by their Masonic traditions. So we have to, again, look at this in its totality. Is that a coincidence that the founders were Freemasons? If you understand how Freemasonry works, it's basically co-opting movements in order to bring about a desired result. And what we do see happening more and more in the modern context is that because a lot of people have not made an effort to, again, explain their beliefs and be clear on where they stand or where they don't stand, we have a Hebrew Israelite movement that, in my opinion, is heavily infiltrated with people who are provocators. What are provocators? They are people who come out and literally on purpose go out and share the a message that's first of all contrary to scripture or they'll share a message in such a way to offend the people of the society the people the lay people the public they'll do it in such a way to incite 
cultivate anger and hatred towards the people who might have nothing to do with the, their methodology, who might just be people who are humble servants of Yah. So that's what provocateurs do. And I have no, um, I, I have a strong belief that them being Freemasons go right directly to that idea that again, what does Lucifer, Satan, what does he do whenever he's trying to corrupt a movement, when he's trying to come in and replace a message? He plants his seeds with people who are not going to share the truth or share some truth and mix it with some lies. And for many of us, because we're so happy to hear the truth, we'll ignore the lies because we'd rather be in a position where people are sharing some truth, even with lies, rather than hearing none of the truth at all. So understanding this, again, understanding this is the origins or again, from what my sources say, the origins of the Hebrew Israelite movement. And I know it's Wikipedia. I did consult other sources, but this is the one that I think puts it all together. Um, let's go forward with some more reading. So it says the second phase of Hebrew Israelitism began roughly in the 1910s, the era of the Great Migration, the mass movement of black people away from the Jim Crow South into the West and into the industrial centers of the Midwest. The result was a number of movements that were more heavily Judaized, borrowing from the mainstream and contemporary Jewish practices and beliefs. Key figures were Arnold Joseph Ford and Winforth Arthur Matthew, both of whom went by the title rabbi and open congregations in Harlem in the 1910s and the 20s. Ford, who knew Hebrew and was involved in Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, founded Beth in Nay, Israel in 1923, and with Mordecai Herman, the Morris Zionist Temple at around the same time, then finally Beth Benai, uh, Abraham, Abraham Dorman suggests that for his preference for the term Hebrew and Israelite rather than Jew helped to carve out an anonymous identity separate from white Jews. From 1930s to the 1970s, a visitor of the Ethiopian Hebrew Commandment Keepers Congregation in Harlem and on a Saturday morning would have found Rabbi Matthew leading a room of African-Americans engaged in Hebrew prayer. The men wearing Jewish prayer shawls and skull caps, the women sitting in a separate section at the rear. At the midpoint of the service, the diminutive bearded rabbi would remove the Torah from its enclosure and lead others around the synagogue. They too preferred Hebrew and Israelite instead of Jew, but it is typical of the second phase that the commandment keepers progressively incorporated more Jewish rituals and decreased the prominence of Jesus as the decades passed. Matthew, who also ordained rabbis, taught that black people were descended from Abraham, but did not teach as Cherry and others had that Jewish people had conspired to cover this up. In America, Hebrew Israelites were inspired by the Ethiopian defeat of Italy in the 1890s and by a growing global awareness of Ethiopian traditions, which I will discuss, were not just the Beta Israels, but common among Ethiopian Christians as well of the descent of the Solomon and Sheba. So why go through this history? Again, it's not to demonize people who came long ago, even if you have different beliefs about them, but... It's very important to emphasize the term Hebrew Israelite does not necessarily contain one one list of beliefs to the point where if you identify yourself with that, you could be identifying yourself with beliefs you don't believe in. For example, I don't believe in the Talmud. Some people who are Hebrew Israelite do, but that you're not going to figure out just from a label. You get that. You get that basically by explaining your position, explaining what you believe and what you don't believe, explaining what you see wrong with things, not just taking a general label or a general title and going out into the world who has no idea what you're talking about and assuming that they're going to catch on. As for me, I personally would not attach myself to that label. Again, there's a history that goes beyond that that I don't attach myself to. The term Hebrew Israelite together is not in the Bible. Hebrew is the genealogy obviously coming from Abraham. Um, but also the Israelite component is about a nation, the nation of Israel. So combining those two, I'm not against it. If you call me that, I'm not going to go out of my way to be upset. But it's not a biblical term. And anything that's not biblical, I'm not personally identifying myself with. Now, For me, the biggest thing that I find of importance to is to emphasize that I follow the way, the way being the teachings of Yahusha. Now, am I of the belief that 
Africans throughout the diaspora or of Hebrew origin or the children of Yashiro. Absolutely, I believe that. Do I believe that there is an importance in recognizing that? Absolutely. Because when we recognize that, we're told in scripture that we're we're starting to figure out, number one, that Yahusha is going to be coming back very soon. When we recognize that, we can also figure out the root of our problems and we can repent for this problem of, of our ancestors. When we recognize that, we can have um, more appreciation I think than many of us probably do for the scriptures, reading it, understanding that this is the details of a lineage. This is your lineage. Even though you've been taught that you are the lowest of the low, even though you've been taught that you're ugly and, you know, far from the image of, of, of Yah, you're the opposite. You are literally his chosen people. That's an important thing to know. We know it's important, obviously, that Yasharel is going to be of major importance in the end time. So people who try to act like, oh, I'm just a Christian. I don't want to talk about the Hebrew Israelite or who's an Israelite who's not. He's a Hebrew who's not. Those people have not read their Bible because the Bible is all about who they are. The Bible is all about the bloodline. But let me be clear. I believe that the people who will be Israel in the end or Yasharel in the end, there's going to be people who are of the bloodline. There's going to be people who are not of the bloodline because in Yahusha, there's not Jew or Gentile. You're not going to be looking at someone who also got saved and died to themselves and gave themselves to Yahuwah, gave themselves to Yahusha, someone who's practicing the word, practicing, following the commands. You're not going to be able to look at someone like that in a caste system type of way. You're not going to be looking at them as lower than you because because guess what? At that point, they're as good as they're as good as Israel and as a Yah. And so who are you to make a differentiation? So those are the things that I believe. I, so I wanted to interrupt our series on coming to Christianity just to explain that a little bit better from my own perspective. And I definitely think I'm going to do a video probably later on on why I became convinced that we are the children of Yasharel. Because if you know me again, originally I did not take that position. Originally, I was very strongly of the opinion that people who called themselves Hebrew Israelites were trying to co-opt an identity that wasn't theirs, trying to um, basically cling to something that's not ours. That was my original position. And what changed scripture is what changed my position on that first. And then everything else on that was a confirmation. And I will definitely get in details on that. If you want to get the cheat sheet, again, I document it pretty well. To me, I use a lot of convincing evidence and sources that point to that reality inside of the book conspiracy to race and nation so you're free to read that if you want some more information but for this video i hope that was helpful and edifying as always you know let's keep the conversation going in respect and um, understanding different people have different perspectives but as long as you're engaging willfully in conversation i won't delete your comment if you're making flyby comments that's when i will delete your comment because you're not here to um, to conversate. You're here to make a point and then go to the next video. So thank you all for watching and y'all willing. I'll see you on the next video. And uh, we have now uh, stepped forward to have a discussion about the black male secret society known as Sigma Pi Phi, uh, acronym the Boule, B-O-U-L-E. Much of our black press, as much as we like it, has not been honest in talking about this group of black men for they respect it very highly and never speak negatively against it. We also know that we've had many black people who've been a member of it and have never ever broken the code or the creed and spoken to one who was a non-member. So they pledge and swear that their goal is to represent you you will have a hard time believing it when they don't even seek to let you know that they who help you are. And so, in July 17th, 1990, July 18th, 1990, the Los Angeles Times did a front page story on the left column about elite fraternity of black men. Excuse me, brother. I, I, I should be on my side out and get away. <laughs> I'm just shaving myself. I stand back here. Uh, this elite fraternity of black men were described in the article as being influential, as being somewhat like Skull and Bones at Yale. And as it said these things, I was little in awe as the others, brothers in African Minds United and the 
coalition against black exploitation, as we all were intrigued by the fact that this group of men could have been in existence and we not know about them. And even other brothers and sisters, I remember talking to a brother who had been National Executive Secretary of Sigma, uh, 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 Phi Beta Sigma, been in fraternity land 37 years, had heard nothing of the Boule ever, though its founder had been a member. And so, as we began to talk about it with other people around the country, we began to realize that people didn't know about it. How you doing, Brother Warren? And did not knowing that people didn't know about it, we just assumed that it was incidental, that everybody must know something about it, and that it was not mysterious or connected to all of those other things we had previously been talking about, like Cecil Rhodes and, and Baron de Rothschild and all the Halls of Haters, the ADL and the Diamond Jewish Connection. We've been talking about the Trilateral Commission, uh, who is responsible for this economic summit that you'll be seeing on TV the next three, four days. You need to know that. Anybody? Carl Rowan came on the radio right here in L.A. And my friends jumped him because we're jumping them in every city. And when they jumped him, he said the Trilateral Commission ain't done nothing. But the Trilateral Commission went to the president and had him set up the annual economic summit starting in 76. France. So when you listen to how your destiny of your country, they say, rides on that meeting, you wonder how Warren could make such an allegation, but knowing as a boule in Washington, D.C. Epsilon chapter, his goal is to never speak of the high, white, and mighty whom the boule, all 3,300, are sworn to protect. Yes, these brothers that we are pushing up against the wall have taken a sworn oath that they will never expose the whites that they know actually run the world. They, in ambition and in deference to liberation and respect of the race, have agreed to maintain the status quo of white supremacy which has two levels of white supremacy, a local, limited, parochial side, the Ku Klux Klan, the Reardons, the Kenny Hans, the local clans, but has a powerful, more mighty upper crust, which probably would include Occidental Petroleum and Arco and Exxon and Mobile Oil and the Rockefeller Foundation and other influential wealthy families and institutions. So what we're talking about is why haven't you heard of those people who are in the secret society? It's because the people who you look to, who you would most suspect would tell you, have sworn that they never will. And because of that, that leaves the sub-leadership, the other group of people that you like a lot, that leaves them to tell you the heads of the various organizations as you know them. But if you listen to them, they have never said of these black men, for that they did not know. Which means that Malcolm, we know knew of these men. We know Marcus Garvey knew of these men because their crowning most outstanding achievement was the physical elimination and castigation of Marcus Garvey and the insistence in the climate setting that brought about the death of Malcolm X. This is the original LA Times article. Everybody see that? Did you see that when it ran in 1990? You did see it. No, you didn't. What's the date on it? That's July 18th, 1990. Elite Fraternity Widens Agenda of Black Men. This is the original article that came out on the boule that we just casually discussed here at The Good Life, which led to this penetration. Because by the time Bill Oswald gets up and starts decodifying a little of that symbolism, you will see that we have in fact cracked a riddle that has contained our people. Our people have been contained by an organized element of secret people who have used riddles 
mysteries and secret societies to jam us. <laughs> and what we are doing is we are unlocking or decodifying the mystery because once decodified and exposed, those who are secret in the light will not be as effective. Because what we found out is, is that when you're a skull and bones, when you go over, you're called a knight. <laughs> and the knight is symbolic of the knight of the round table. And that that round table is the code word or the buzzword for an upper, upper secret society that's in a book called Anglo-American Establishment written by Carol Quigley. And in that book, he said in the opening that that secret society of which the Rhodes Scholars come from is known as Several names. This society has been known at various times as Milner's Kindergarten, as the Round Table Group. Okay, just hold it right there. Look at that page a second if you can read it. Because that page is very significant to the discussion of who it is might be the ones that the Boule has to cover for. In other words, they're covering for something. Now we know whatever they're covering for is beastly. In the book by Mary Palmer Hall on the flower plant, plant, fruits and trees, there was a tree showing the Knights of the Round Table. What I thought was interesting when I looked at the tree carefully is that in your mind we always thought about the tree in 12. But if you look carefully, it says the tree of the Knights of the Round Table you find out that there are one night, two nights, three nights, four nights, five nights, six nights, seven nights, eight nights, nine nights. Those nine represent the symbolic nine that's used in the Grecian Sphinx, which we'll be talking about shortly. Now we're going to show from that eulogy of uh, Charles Wesley's, in that same uh, book, that same night, we found this in tribute to Wesley. Look carefully at the wordage. I'll give you a second to read it. Table round. You find that for some reason they take Alfred Lord Tennyson and put him on the left side and put Wesley on the right side. The only thing is similar in both discussions is the damn word round table. Model for a mighty world. What's that in the man's hand? What's that in the man's hand? Brother Quasi, does that have any symbolism there, that little spike with the light on it? Oh, yes, sir. What's, what, what would that mean? Prometheus. Uh, Prometheus is one who stole the light. All the Greeks had to pass the burning sands, the burning sands coming across from the head to Mount Olympus, is where the light was being built here. That's why we got the Statue of Liberty, because the French gave America the Statue of Liberty, because they are the land case. So we got the new light. We just heard from Carol Quigley, who talked about the top of the top of the white secret societies. And he says it's known by several names, which you knew that the, anything you ever read on the Illuminati says, we will have numerous names. You will not know it as one name. It does not even go under the name Illuminati. That is that Illuminati you've been looking for. Oh, round table, round table, and the boule will never acknowledge knowledge of it because it's their goal to protect it and keep it secret. Maybe that's why they didn't want to tell us who they were, because then we'd have to say, "Well, what are you doing standing there?" 